But um, this is super cool for me just to like introduce Aaron to Ian and Ian uh, is our guest on the show for he's pirating the ship today yeah. <laughs> and uh, we're going to do a little bit of a dive on Ian and he's a he's a glass blower currently based out of Boulder, Colorado. And I've known Ian for, I'd say the better part of eight years. And we connected through, I mean, we connected through, uh, through like-minded people in New York, but a lot of it had to do with like Grateful Dead scene, fish vibes, all of that. And then I had mentioned that to you, Aaron, and you were like, oh, I was on tour for a year. Like, uh, this is going to be like a cool conversation. So I, anyway, oh, yeah. it's just, I'm stoked to introduce Ian to Aaron. And then also just to share with everybody that's checking out the show, like Ian's work and why uh, why I really wanted him to be the first guest uh, on the show. Honored, feel very honored. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you this, cool. Aaron. I mean, Ian, like when when uh, when I think about you doing your glass blowing and all of that, like where did where did that come from? Like it definitely. I can't really separate the the like live band scene from like what you're doing now or am I wrong? Um, I mean, are you saying as far as like how it kind of all started? Um, yeah, because I mean like you've gone, you've done like culinary stuff, you've done like other things yeah. with time, like now you've transitioned into this, but like when I really zoom out of it, it was kind of like a long time coming, if you ask me. Oh, 100%. I mean, I, you know, I think I was always drawn to the flame, you know, per se, but it, you know, I've, I grew up even as a young kid in upstate New York, my aunt, uh, she worked at Bard College and she would actually like watch me a lot. So I'd like be a little kid, get off the bus, you know, go hang out at Bard College. And I was always submersed just in the art scene, you know, even as a little kid and, you know, going to culinary school up in Vermont, um, they're, you know, smoking weed as a young kid and, you know, wanting a new pipe. I went up to Burlington, Vermont, and there was this head shop, the Byrne Gallery, um, and met a couple of dudes. It was Tito Byrne, who was one of the owners, and this other guy, Johnny K, and I saw him blowing glass, and I just, like, fell in love, and I instantly told my folks where I was like, I want to drop out of school. I just want to blow glass all day. And they're like, well, let's pump the brakes, you know, let's, <laughs> you know, let's, let's see what we can do. And a couple of years later, found myself up in Washington uh, state. And, you know, it's kind of like living on my brother's couch, working in the food scene, figuring my life out and ended up getting a job as one of the head chefs at Pilchuck glass school up in Stanwood, Washington. And I met a bunch of glass blowers from all around the world, and life kind of found me. What year was that? We think like year that was. I that was about six years ago. I think seven years ago. Uh -huh. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was. Yeah, about seven years ago. I think this. Like. Yeah. Um. And ended up. It was a seasonal gig, so it would only go from like April to October, and. You know, as the season was coming to an end, it was kind of like, what am I going to do for the season? And, you know, I was in my phase of like traveling around the country and just kind of getting, you know, a little burnt out of that and wanting like, you know, a bed in a home, you know, porcelain <laughs> toilet, you know, the luxuries of life. And found myself out in Colorado and started blowing glass with this woman, Case Ass. And, yeah, you know, it, uh, it needed to happen. It, you know, there was certain situations that weren't ideal, but it kind of gives you thicker skin and makes you learn how to, you know, stand up for yourself and, you know, be a little more self-sufficient in the art world. And yeah, that kind of led me to meet some other people and kind of starting to develop my own, you know, style and skills. And that kind of brings me to today, you know, working with my buddy Regis now out in Longmont, Colorado. Um, yeah. So, so what kind of glass do you like specialize in? Like what's the area? Uh, right now I'm, you know, predominantly making, I mean, it's pipes, pendants, marbles, um, you know, so functional you, glass. You kind of do a lot of like kind of everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. all borosilic based. Um, so it's, I mean, if you want to say as far as like the heady world of glass, you know, pipe scene. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. But 
right now, you know, I've been doing a lot of production work for different people over the years and I'm helping my buddy Regis out with, you know, with some of his stuff and, you know, in exchange, he's showing me a lot, you know, especially just like the business side, um, which, you know, during like COVID and everything else, I mean, it's actually, it's been awesome. I mean, sales are, people are smoking more and people <laughs> are a lot more and, you know, I feel like super grateful and fortunate just to be able to like make art and not be working in like the food scene and slave in a way, you know, for somebody else's dime, you know, and not hating on that at all. I mean, it's, it's, I did that for most of my whole life. Um, but being able to get out and just really, you know, f- wake up and follow your own passion, your own dream, you know, it's just, it's a blessing. Um, but yeah, but you know, right now it's working on a lot of, you know, I'm kind of, I'm doing this a lot of like kind of modern style, I guess, um, where it's kind of just like solid colors, um, you know, just trying to refine and, you know, clean up a lot of my lines and a lot of, you know, as far as like shaping goes, just making things like super pristine. Um, so for like mini rigs, you know, you know, and things of that nature, it's kind of just like solid color tubing, you know, with like clear bottoms, um, you know, and those are on the production side. So it's more of putting those in, you know, dispensaries and places of that nature, um, you know, but working on trying to get into like new styles and having it where it's more pattern work, you know, but yeah, it's yeah. fun. I wanted, I just wanted to like ask as somebody that doesn't really know that much about the glass scene personally. And I'm always just like, it's my friend. So he's the shit, you know, but like, <laughs> so what is it like to be uh, working with Regis? Who's like, obviously doing some next level thing but it's not necessarily like it may not necessarily be something that you would have ever thought that you'd even have a hand in you know what I mean like it's somebody else is like masterpiece but like you know I've been there on murals where it's like I'm stoked just to be holding the paintbrush but like I'm being told what to do every step of the way you know 100 percent, 100 percent. I mean it's humbling you yeah. know I mean it's every day I mean it it's a lot of it's mixed emotions because it's you know, becoming homies with someone who's just a rad dude like yourselves, but then they're like working on, you know, their way up and being like some of the better artists in the world, you know, in the world, you know, it's, it's incredibly humbling, but it's also like makes you super eager to just like want to get in there and like work more. Cause you can see that and be like, well, he's just a regular dude. So it's like anybody not necessarily anybody I'm not trying to downplay I mean he's been doing it for like 16 years you know and in really pushing I mean that guy works harder than anyone I know um but you know it just makes you want to like it's inspiring you yeah. know but very humbling at the same time because at least for me glass the medium of glass it's I mean, it's incredible. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done, but it's also like the most satisfying, gratifying thing where you're just like, you know, whether it's piece breaks, you know, and you want to just immediately want to get back in the saddle and just keep crushing it and just keep getting to it. And then once you make, you know, finish a piece, you're just like, oh, fuck yeah. Like this is the best day ever, you know, <laughs> but it's, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's really cool to work, you know, work along someone. Yeah, just as as far as like such a high caliber, you know, of artists as him. And he doesn't just do glass. Like he's like a true artist, and you know, where it's like he work, makes these little miniatures. Um and they're out of like just like different pieces, just like anything out of wood. So he'll make like mini kilns that light up with the lights from those little like train tracks that would like power the uh like the stoplights and everything, but he makes them where they're wall mounted and he sells those. He makes like mini galleries, you know, that can like actually be like virtual galleries that he'll link to like websites or Instagram, um, but then it'll physically be like an actual piece. Um, I don't know, it's, it's cool. It's cool, you know, just being around that creative, just creative passion all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So would you say, so he's like mentoring you? Is that sort of like what you would say the relationship y'all have at this point? It, yeah, it's turned into that for yeah. sure. You know, I mean, I mean, he's a homie, you know, and it's like, it's definitely like close friend, but it's, you know, he's, I mean, he's got probably like 10 years on me, you mm-hmm. know, just age wise, you know, so it's definitely, there's some life lessons, you know, that you 
they're being taught, you know, as well without, whether it's, you know, purposefully or not, but there's definitely things where you're just like, oh, wow, that's, huh, <laughs> store that, you know, in the back pocket, you know, for yeah. later. Hey, is that your phone, Ian? Can you, can you put your phone on silent if you're blowing up? Uh, that's actually my email. Sorry. It's oh, popular. It's awesome. <laughs> but you're not a tech whiz like me and Aaron? It's not at all. I barely know how to use a computer. <laughs> I know, I know Ian and I have definitely crossed paths in California and Colorado, New York, gone to a bunch of shows together, but I want to hear, like, I didn't know that you had been on tour for a minute, Aaron, like, tell me what that, what was that like, you know, yeah. like, you just know how so, grindy fish tour can be, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. We have a couple things in common. Cause I, I, I also grew up in Colorado and I went to college in Boulder. Um, oh, cool. So Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's how I got into fish. Uh, like my best friend in college was a huge, huge fish head. And so, uh, yeah, it was, I think the summer of 2008, right when they got back together, um, we, he was just chomping at the bit and I went and, uh, you know, I went and visited him out in, uh, he's from Jersey. So I went out there and we drove to, to the, what's the Red Sox stadium oh, uh, or something. Yeah, Fenway. We went cool. to see Fish and Fenway, and we just did we did a little run of shows, maybe five or six shows over there in on the East Coast, and then later in the summer, we did a road trip to California and saw fish in like uh, we saw fish in like North Northern California, and then we drove up to the Gorge and saw them at the Gorge in Washington. Oh, yeah, hell yeah, yeah. that's so awesome. We did did a little thing there, but I mean, it makes sense. Like, were you inspired? Because I mean, there's definitely a huge glass market you know a lot of people are selling glass and you get to see some really really great pieces uh was that inspiring did you ever like do that hustle like with glass and stuff not to the extent that a lot of those you know guys and girls do um but as far as being inspired by it a hundred percent yeah um, I mean, you know growing up in upstate new york i mean my parents you know being deadheads i was introduced you know just around that scene oh, awesome. at you know a pretty young age um, I remember going to like further festivals and things, you know, when I was like a little kid. Um, <laughs> That's so badass. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was cool, you know, especially the older you get, you start to like appreciate it more. It's kind of being like uh -huh. a teenager that's like, oh, fuck you, mom and dad. You know? <laughs> but, it, you know, it, it definitely as I got older, you know, and gotten, you know, probably around the same time, like 2008, you know, as far as fish scene, um, you know, and, but definitely just seeing all the glass and seeing everything there and being like, wait, these people make a living and like, they're making a bunch of money. And, you know, not to say the money's a driving factor, but like, you know, the pipe scene, especially when it was underground before like recreational weed and like legalization, you know, in different states, and, you know, it was, it was a degenerate, you know, underground thing. It was like frowned upon. And there was far and few between as far as like pipe makers. So you could, you know, when you were good and you actually like figured out, you know, what you were doing, you could make a really good living and not saying you can't now, but it's just the market's way more saturated. Yeah. But yeah, but I mean, the, yeah, influence of fish. I mean, it fish, fish itself, like the band itself probably was one of the major influences on the pipe scene in general, because just that's how a lot of guys were actually selling their pipes. Mm hmm. You know, where they would, you know, a lot of it, you know, they would learn from cats out in Oregon and Washington state, go on tour on the East coast and around the country, and then spread that kind of those techniques and different styles of glass, you know, and pipes around and then go back in the winter time, learn more stuff and then crush, you know, a bunch of glass out and go back on tour and sell it. But yeah, that's, yeah, that's crazy. I mean, the effect of like, jam bands you know that whole tour thing i think can't be understated because like no. you know I, I they talk about that a lot how when the dead would come through that's kind of like how they would spread like acid throughout the country uh, yeah. but, <laughs> you know but beyond just the psychedelics it i mean there's a lot of art and things and culture that would be passed along you know pre-internet days and i think that's really oh. important you know because this stuff is now mainstream like i i like now that weed is like weed won 2020 election you know like it's legalized yeah. in i think five more states now so mm -hmm. there's just so many people who are coming up now who are just going to be like yeah i want to blow some glass i want to make some of this stuff and like 
I think mm-hmm. you're, you're going to see a huge like flowering of that of that art, you know, and that craft as it becomes more mainstream. Oh yeah, I hope so. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's it's still. I mean, glass is it's such an old, you know, it's been around for thousands of years, but we're watching it, especially with you know social media and everything. It's transforming so fast. Mm. You know, and I think, you know, just like you're saying, Aaron, where the more, you know, the more it becomes popular, popularized and legalized, you know, where that fear is less of like, oh, I'm going to go to jail for having a pipe as that, you know, fades away. More and more people will want to like, will realize where it's like, wow, I can make a living out of my garage. This is so cool. Like I can work <laughs> for myself and like, you know, and it's not all you know, just smoking weed and, you know, roses. It's it's a lot, it's, it's a lot of hard work and years, you know, of of practice and, and knowing the right people, but, but you can do it, you know, Mm -hmm. like anybody, if they, if they're, you know, persistent enough and have the passion, you know, go create more art, go make more glass. And and I think, you know, it's also like, cause I have a, a really good friend that I know here in Austin and he's like a really awesome glass artist and it's interesting because, you know, he got started in the same kind of realm, started making pipes and bongs and stuff. But then um, he got really deep into marbles and he just like once he started getting into that, he just let everything else go. He would make like, you know, if he needed some money, he would, you know, bang out a bunch of small pipes to sell it like a, a show or something. But like he just really set his craft, like, I'm just going to make the best damn marbles I can. And he got so into it using all these different, like, glow-in-the-dark glasses and and colors and stuff. I forget what they're all called, but I think that's another part of the scene that, like, you know, most people, when they hear about glass blowing, they'll probably be like, you know, it's either, you know, fancy stuff you buy at, like, a, you know, for thousands of dollars at some, like, import store or something like that or they think of pipes and stuff but there's a whole world of like marbles and just other like figurines and things that people can get into with glass that I think is really cool oh yeah I mean it's it's limitless you can in in marbles yeah I used to work with a guy Freddie Farron here in Colorado I mean guy makes huge marbles like three inch just sort of like dichro and like all the spirals and swirls and Uh uh-huh I mean, just, and he does a lot of fuming. So he'll use like gold and silver fume uh, to create color on clear glass. Um, but just watching him work, I mean, he would sometimes take two torches, you know, and line them up just to like get it, like get enough of a heat base to like melt, just like masses, pe- massive pieces of glass. And just like, how are you, like, how do you keep that on center just with like one hand? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's cool. What's, what's your, who's your buddy in, down in Austin? Uh, oh, God. Uh, so his name is Eric. I'm trying to remember his glass blowing name, though. He doesn't go by his real name, which, oh, and that's, a, that's actually an interesting thing. I'll see if I can find his name. But uh, he was telling me that a lot in glass, a lot of artists, it's very common for them to go by like a mm-hmm. moniker instead of their full name like fine artists you know you have to go by james p whatever you know but in glass you can really just kind of establish an identity as like you know this you know a name or something you know oh yeah and that all actually stems from the beginning kind of like the yeah what's the name of that documentary aaron i mean uh ian the oh uh, yeah yeah, degenerate art yeah Uh, yeah yeah, it's a that good. It's so eye opening. If anybody hasn't seen Degenerate Art, check that out. Like, just you, you don't understand that people were like going away for making bongs, and people were like just doing that on the super low. I don't know. It's funny because it's like not that long ago. It's like yeah. the it's, in California, and you're like, what the fuck, for real? Yeah, it was early two thousands. Yeah, early two thousands exactly. Even worse. Yeah, it, there was a, it was the dawn of the internet, pretty much when the what was it Operation Pipe Dreams, I think. Um, yeah 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 when you could start like buying pipes from what was like grass city or like some of those like early websites for like uh buying pipes and stuff right and i think that all stemmed and maybe don't quote me on this but i'm pretty sure that all stemmed from some like fbi agents that had like younger kids that got some paraphernalia you know or like bought a bong online with you know mommy and daddy's credit card and they got upset with that and just went after a bunch of the big players who were selling glass predominantly out in like california oregon um and they just 
shut all their stuff down, took all their assets and put them in jail for a few nights and then let them go. But it's, you know, it made everyone go underground again and be just, and it's, you know, where a lot of like the monikers, you know, and like the fake, not fake names, but, you know, just having a different name. So it just kind of separates yourself from your, you know, your art or your glass and your own person. You know, just as like a safety precaution. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah that's the other thing that I think is like, uh, probably, I probably find most interesting about you, Ian, is like, you've been to every state, right? Like all 50 states. Yeah. Every, yeah I've been all 50 states. National park too? Not every national park, but I've probably been close to like 38 or 40 national parks at this point. <laughs> at like what at what point were you like I, I like I got 38 states down I have to do 50 like what made you like have to do that <laughs> um it started you remember Rudy back at like Omega yeah so it started when our buddy Rudy and Matt and myself this is eight nine years ago um and we bought a van and it was three dudes living in a van traveling around the country and we have national parks pass and we were just like let's just like go see you know the west coast we're a couple east coast kids you know we're all like 20 21 22 or so and yeah we just kind of wanted to just see what life had to offer and you know that that just grew into being where just more and more of just want to check the world out you know and at least seeing what this country had to offer because you could physically drive to it you know didn't need a passport didn't need to you know go fly somewhere else or learn another language you know but yeah i mean it just started racking them up and it was also back then and i know things are changing now but it was a lot easier to do that where you know not even speaking covid terms but you know, the national parks pass for like 80 or 90 bucks, it got one vehicle into every national park for free or for the cost of the pass. But then it also used to get you free camping. And so it made it really inexpensive to just like, you know, travel and, you know, if you want to, you know, choosing to be homeless or addressless and be able to just like travel around the country and, you know, live moderately inexpensive. You know, and then you go out to California and, you know, when the whole like trim scene and all that, you know, you could do, um, you know, make some money and continue traveling on, um, you know, and that kind of where that all stems from. Um, and then over the years, just, I mean, it was just super fun. It's also like just liberating. We're just getting out into like the national parks and just being out in nature and getting away from everyday society for myself, at least it's, you know, it's, I don't know. There's a lot of inspiration in nature, I find. But yeah. But that's kind of where, yeah, all 50 states and however many <laughs> national parks at this point turned into. Yeah. <laughs> and now, you know, then it just kind of snowballs where you're just like, well, now I just got to do all of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I just, I don't think I've met that many people that have been to every, like, you know, I've seen the RVs where they have like a lot of the stickers of the states filled in, you know, but like not that many have been to 50 that I know. Totally. No, there's, I was looking up online. It's somebody made like a t-shirt and like a little, like <laughs> one of those, like a pin that's like, I've completed all 50. Yeah. That's like really funny to get one of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Watch out for your birthday next year, dude. <laughs> <That's> awesome <laughs> get like a little stamp of approval or something <laughs> yeah yeah but uh, yeah i mean I, I i don't know i mean i know you've jesse like you've traveled around you know the world a lot more than i have and that's something you know i aspire to do you know and i don't know if aaron if you've you know traveled outside of the country much um like i've only been i mean canada you know south america and you know i've been to paris um but you know, I, there was something even I was like a younger, you know, kid or young adult, just wanting to see like, where I'm from, you know, and know like, what makes this country like actually this country and not all like the, you know, superficial, you know, BS that's in our face, but like, well, like, this is the heart of America, you know, is I don't know, it's like, maybe it's cheesier, but it's, you know, I think you put, you know, putting a lot of media and everything else aside and just like what we see day to day you know i'm getting back to realizing you know that this land is 
what this country really is, you know, and these people, you know, who, you know, us, we're just living on it. You know, and there's, I don't know, there's a lot of really just cool culture and history, you know, a lot of native culture, you know, that I think a lot more people should, you know, should really understand, you know, and get to know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for anybody that like just goes to a national park, any one that I've ever been to, I've always been blown away. Yeah, I never found it to be like a waste of time. And um, I don't know, for me, like as our our friendship has grown over the years, like you've always been a good reminder for me to like just go out into nature, reset. And I mean, that is where at least like I'd say seventy five percent of my inspiration comes just from like being out in nature. You know, and it's like something so simple, but like it's so remarkable um, and it can be so different, like vastly different if you're in this park versus Yosemite versus, you know, one of the Red Rock parks or, you know, like yeah. just just the, the vastness of beauty is just remarkable. And then the act of just going out there is always the same, though, you know, which is like whatever. Sometimes it just takes your friend to be like, get back outside, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think about this, like I try to, uh, so where I live now, um, there's like a really nice kind of little foresty trail kind of just within like right outside my uh, neighborhood. And, um, and I go there a lot to walk. And I always think about this concept from Japan called, they, I forget what the word is, but it translates to forest bath. <laughs> and I think there's something about that where it's like, I need to go take a forest bath where it's like you go out and just being in nature and like smelling it and like the trees and the sounds of it. Uh, I think it's like super important, especially for all of us who live in, uh, live in cities, like you really lose your connection to the, the world. And uh, I think it's super important to get out there and just realize that there's all these trees and animals and rivers and shit that don't care about you at all. Like they're not worth like all the things that you're worried about, like there's birds flying around and they just live out there. Like they don't, and, and something about that just feels so nice to me, you know? Um, Ooh, we got a reward for using Zoom. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> we can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's true though. I mean, I think, I think nature and just, there's something to be said of just getting outside and you know, just detaching from everyday life, you know, yeah. getting back to, you know, from our reality and getting back to reality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I watched the sunset with like four friends yesterday and it's, uh, it's something that's so simple. And like, I don't remember the last time I did that. And it was, it was awesome. I'm like still uplifted from it nearly 24 hours later. <laughs> there's like pictures you know like that's how epic it is there, there's for no reason you're in a good mood you're with your friends there's fresh air I mean like I, I don't know I I'm one of those people that needs that simple reminder like constantly because otherwise it's like yeah. especially now in this day and age it's so easy to just be locked online or working from home or whatever mm -hmm. like uh what, whatever it is I don't know if you guys like look at your screen time or whatever but mine is like gross sometimes like, yeah oh, no. <laughs> it's terrible it's like yeah it's disgusting yeah I, I i was listening to uh i think it was uh jordan peterson or someone like that the other day on, a, on what i was driving and he was talking about like how you know we actually lose this sense of awe that we used to have like we don't see the sky anymore but like and, we, and that's one of the things that really sticks out when you go to a a, a, a park is that like you look up and you just see the sky covered with stars and it just fills you with awe. And it's easy to forget that people saw that every night, like every night they would go outside and see that. And you would just have this, like, and, and it's really easy. Like, I like, when was the last time you really felt awe just like yeah. in your daily life where, you know, you're like, Whoa, Oh my God. And, and I think it's, there's something to that people like, I see amazing clouds and sunsets here in Texas. And I have to, I use that as a reminder to be like, wow, that's like to appreciate like the sense of awe that connects you to this world. And yeah, I think nature in general creates that sense of awe and helps you to, to stay grounded. I think, you know, definitely, definitely. It's, 
Yeah. You know, I mean, whether it's like, especially like when you look up at the night skies, I mean, at least for myself, space has always been a fascinating, yeah. you know, and it's, it, you know, it's that constant state of awe. We're just like, what? <laughs> we, have, we have no idea what's out there. You know, yeah. I mean, it's like, sure, like what they tell us or, you know, what, you know, pictures we see, you know, but it's like, we don't really know. We have no idea. You know, and it's, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's cool, to, like, let your imagination run and be like, maybe there is like something that's like, anything you know anything's possible there's got to be something out there <laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> but you brought up jordan uh, peterson aaron like i as much as there's people that feel very strongly about jordan you know and i think his work uh -huh. is uh remarkable i know he's had his like personal struggles with things but we i'm sure we all have like uh and it's one of those situations where i like have been able to separate the person from the work a little bit but like one of his videos or maybe it was an interview or something, but like one of them really like it, like taught me how to manage my time a lot better. And like, I don't know if you guys have to maintain like a busy schedule and still want to be creative and like block time for that is something, is that something that like at this point comes natural to both of you? Like, cause no. even to this day, like <laughs> 10 years down the road of being like, I'm going to fucking paint every day. Like there's times where I, I have to like really block out I have to make up hours basically is what I feel like. Cause I, you know, I just I haven't done that or I've been lazy or I've been like, mm -hmm. I'm going to let my depression win today instead of like even just doing one sketch or whatever. Like, is there any technique that you guys have found that's like, that gives you that block like more regularly than not? Uh, I, speaking for myself, it's I'm, I'm pretty bad at when it comes to like blocking time <laughs> out and just being like, timely um you know it i don't know it's, it's hard i mean there's certain days i think where i'm you know super jazz you get up early and you're just like all right just get everything done and, you know that you need to and just like get into work and start working and there's other days where it's like oh it's like three o'clock i have just been like laying around being a piece of shit all day like i need <laughs> to like force myself to go blow glass like what am i doing <laughs> you know it's i, I don't know it's being human I, I don't know i don't know you know there's i don't know maybe you have some suggestions aaron <laughs> yeah i i do that's uh it's been a huge area of focus for me and especially lately but over the past few years um i re definitely read a lot of books on like, like productivity and stuff and and establishing a practice so i make music you know i, I produce electronic music and so yeah it's definitely been a, a big thing of like you know you got to get up there and just make it um i would say uh, there's some in my, my head uh, there's like a lot of areas my brain is trying to go right now um with regards to establishing a practice i think a big part of what yeah it's like focusing on where you want to be and then also letting go of the attachment to like at least for me this is important the attachment to creating good work where it's mm -hmm. like uh, you know, you start to like, oh, I need to make something amazing today. And then that's really what writer's block is, you know, and writer's block of any kind of sort. It's you're sitting there and you're like, oh, that's not good. No, that's not good. Uh, and then you feel like you can't write anything. Well, it's like, just write something bad, you know, just make something bad. And just once you get started and you let it go, then you can get into that sense of play. Um, but yeah, time management is... Uh, is really nuts. I just finished a book called Indistractable um, by this guy near Ayal. And his whole thing is like, you know, when you get distracted, the idea is the opposite of distraction is traction. So you need to do things that basically you kind of design your life to, to focus you in the direction. It's kind of like, you know, the classic case, you want to go running, we'll set your shoes and your running shorts by the door. You know, so when you wake up like, oh, I don't have to go and find it. You just, oh, right. my shoes are here, running shorts, I just go for a run. So you do that, but with your with your practice and you figure out little things. I'm trying to do like this thing called time boxing, which is where you kind of, you block out your entire day or your entire week, you know? And the goal is that you, you fill up all of your space. Like there are no blank spaces. And in that time box, you even time box like chilling, you know, like, oh, I just want to, the, you know, six o'clock on Wednesday is when I'm just going to like veg out and watch Netflix, but you, you schedule it that way you make sure that you don't lose out on the things, but 
it's definitely a it's definitely a practice and it's it's tough to get those habits formed you know totally yeah, that's cool. yeah, the, the best i've ever done with it has actually been like being really really busy and this is i got this from somebody in austin when i was gigging down there and that's how aaron and i met doing av gigs together and um this dude david paul he's like this old grouch in the game that like everybody knows anybody who listens to this from austin will know who i'm talking about but like he was like like he's like i get up two hours before every gig like no matter what even if our gig is at 6 a.m i'm up at four and so like i kind of took that in stride and was like then i can actually have a minute to make some coffee actually paint for a second and then i can jump in the shower and just get in my uber and go to my gig even if it's at 6 a.m like at this point i've now been up for two hours i've done something that i liked for myself like i, I remember a lot of times like being so stoked that i did that and like, obviously no judgment of anybody that comes in, but just then you see the other dudes dragging ass, like they, you know, they played a show last night or they worked their night gig and they partied after like, th like having that difference of like, all right, I'm going to be motivated no matter what, I'm going to get up two hours before the a thing I'm supposed to do just to give myself a chance to maybe make art or whatever. Um, I, I don't know. Like, it, it, it's funny to talk about that dude because it's like it's so easy to give him a hard time but like <laughs> at the same time it's like you at a, at a certain point you have to look back on those people and be like that they actually have made you who you are in a way like yeah you know like like the, a hard teacher actually had an effect on you you know like uh -huh. if you dude I, I i think that's a that's something i'm learning now is like the morning like, like the way that you get up is it really does set the tone for the rest of the day. And not that, 100%. I mean, obviously you can correct course. You know, if you have a shitty morning, you can take a moment and be like, all right, the rest of my day is not going to be shitty. But it is it is really, I think, that's something I'm working on and learning that, okay, I need to meditate and do some, you know, do a bit of physical activity and breath work in the morning and just really try to set the course for my day. And, I, you know, waking up early is, I think it's that's huge, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, getting like physical, just breathing in the morning, you know, waking yeah. up, you know, having a schedule, waking up. Um, I mean, today, I think, what's today? Today's 30th. Monday. Yeah, yeah, Monday. I think today's officially like 30 days of being sober from alcohol for myself. And it's like, oh, badass. Yeah, yeah thanks. Son. Hell yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and it's, it, it, you know, it was just more, you know, my girlfriend and I, we just kind of just like, you know, we earlier in COVID, we actually went like four months um yeah if sober with no alcohol felt great you know and then we're just like kind of got bored with it and we're like eh, i want to drink some alcohol again um mm -hmm. but yeah i mean now it's just doing it just going back into winter and just trying to you know get back into a routine and trying to you know get up earlier and trying to just like you know exercise in the mornings or do some yoga or some form of you know purposeful breathing and just waking your mind and body up and just it sets it's such a huge player for setting the tone for the rest of the day you know and you guys feel like because like a lot of times i kind of feel like the the like hippie spiritual friend to like a lot of people but like i'm looking at both you guys and it's just like you were both mentioning without batting an eye to two strangers being like here's my meditation practice i call it breathing or here's what i what i do i sit you know whatever but like I feel like maybe it's, it's just me and it's like the people that are uh, gravitate towards me, but I don't feel like that many people actually embrace that. And it, I, I feel like it doesn't have to look any certain way. Like it took me a long time to understand like me taking a moment for myself and doing my practice can look a hundred percent different than Aaron or Ian, but like, it, it, like, is there any way that we can like convey to our other brothers like nah it's cool like literally if you just bark, bark like a dog and jump around like three times and that's your thing like i respect that you know what i mean like because it's about the intention and setting the discipline to doing a practice like that to me has been more valuable than any, everything else well I, I think there's something also to be said of not putting so much pressure on you know meditation or spirituality or you know breath work where it's 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 just your daily life you know and it's for myself i you know at an earlier age and you know traveling was a huge you know influence on this where i started realizing that just day-to-day -day life practices are meditations in themselves where 
walking to the store, going to your, you know, finding the keys, you know, making your cup of coffee every morning or tea, um, waking up out of bed and then making your bed, taking your, you know, taking a shower and washing off, you know, the day, the night, you know, sleep or, you know, after when you get home from work and, you know, it's just taking a moment, you know, just to smell the roses, just to literally just take the time to actually focus and be present and not make it where it's like, oh, I have to go like meditate for 30 minutes and I can't think about anything. I have to be perfect or I have to go do yoga and I have to do this like perfect crow position and all, you know, and perfect downward dog. And it's like, we're not all perfect. We're, you know, no one is, you know, I mean, we all got like perfections, but we also like, we all have our own flaws. And I think it's, for whatever reason, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on like the spirituality world and like, whether it's like the new age and, you know, hippies or, you know, or just whatever, but there's a lot of pressure on people to be that, like, you know, to be a perfect person meditating before you even meditate or to be a yogi before you even do yoga, mm. you know, or it's like, same with like, uh -huh. art or, you know, anything. Yeah. Well, yeah, you see that a lot with meditation where people are, I could never meditate because I can't, you know, sit still. And that's like the same thing as like, no, I can't, you know, I can't lose weight because I can't run or what. Like, I'm not going to go to the gym because I can't lift 500 pounds. Well, it's like, that's why you go to the gym, you know? And I think, yeah, letting go of that pressure is, yeah, is really important because ultimately these practices are for what, like what you're saying. That's such an important, like, takeaway, at least for me and reminder you know, it's like, you don't meditate, you don't live to meditate, you meditate to live. It's just about like, practicing, you know, your life is the those little things, you know, closing the door, just saying hi to your roommates, or, you know, your partner, mm -hmm. um, folding your laundry, the little those are that's your life. It's not these like peak experiences. And yoga and breath work and meditation are really just practices to slow you down. And be like, okay, yeah, take a moment before you get into the day. Actually, you know, it's like I was having a realization because sometimes, you know, I'll wake up a little late or I'll go to bed a little late and I'll just be like more antsy to get into the work. And I think along with that kind of perfectionism or whatever you're talking about, it's because we're so product focused, like outcome focused. What am I getting out of this? And I was just kind of thinking about like what I really want to do is like, no, my priority is my like rituals and routines that I'm doing. Because that's like all about me and my well-being. Like if I make the most amazing music or whatever and the most amount of music, it doesn't matter if I'm miserable, you know, if I'm stressed out and I'm pushing it. So it's like, you know what? If I get to music late, it's better that I get to music late, but I did my journaling and I really checked in with myself and I visualized and really made sure that I'm feeling good about who I am and what I'm doing today more so than it is that like, oh, I just need to make tracks. I need to make beats and get it out there and, and get followers on social media. That's what my real purpose, like, no, that's, it's not my purpose, you know? And I think that's like, it's a huge, like, I, like I'm really grateful for that reminder that you gave there, Ian, because that's, yeah, that's huge stuff. Yeah, it's important to slow down. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's another thing I, I want to bring this back into like the I'm sorry to keep talking about the AV scene in Austin but like <laughs> this is another one and, and this is another like David Paul like gem but like there was a day <laughs> where I was uh I was like the lead audio engineer for some fucking conference you know but your day rate's a little bit higher than everybody else so they expect you to be on time obviously. And I was running late and we're talking like 15, 20 minutes late, Austin traffic. I couldn't do anything about it, you know? And I've got like the recruiter on my phone over here and like the client is upset and like all this pressure. So I'm like, at this point, I'm like running up the fucking escalator to like run in and be like their audio engineer. By the time I get there, like nobody gives a fuck that I was late. Like nobody cared. It was just like all in my head in this crap over the phone. Right. Mm -hmm. So David Paul is like, next time it happens to you, just tell them that you're going to be late and be like, I'm going to be an hour late, actually. And he's like, I do that all the time. And I just go and get myself a coffee. I have a cigarette and I walk, I waltz in like when I said I was going to be there and said, yeah, I couldn't find parking. Like having that type of attitude, no matter what you do, I think is super important. So like, accept the fact that you're late, you know? Like own that uh -huh. shit. You, you, there's no going back around it, but there's a way to show up late that's fucking cool. 
And then there's a way to show up late. That's like, you got, you know, you're all worked up and you're, you're going to probably not make a good decision. And, you know, like having that moment of like, all right, I missed my window of like, I'm going to make music today, but I don't want to jump in there into the seat, like relax, you know, take whatever it is that you need to do before we get that done. And then like, you know, actually kind of like a delayed gratification type of thing, like just go there when it's ready, not when it's like, and this is like coming from my experience, like when I paint and I really don't have some shit else going on in my head and I can really be like, no, I can spend my time painting. That's my best work. But like, it's not to say that happens every time that might happen one out of 25 times, you know? And like all the other days where you're like, you wish you could have got to that point. You're, you're like, you're fine edging and like getting your tools, like sharpened for those days where you can actually like work really, really cleanly. But like, I, I, that's, I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. And I think that's what meditation and these spiritual practices like attempt to offer us is that moment of like, okay, now I go and create. Cause like as a creator, it is good to be creating like regularly, but also when you're tapped in and creating consciously, almost like you're holding the pencil for somebody else type of feeling that like, that's really our purpose. And, and I think like somebody that's as prolific in music as Aaron is, and you've made enough glass at this point, Ian, it's like, there's stuff that you do that you're like, I did, I, there's no way I did that. Like, <laughs> I know, I know they said I did that, but there's no way I did that. You know, like. Yeah. Like that's, that's art, right? Or, you know, that's one of my definitions for it. Totally. Yeah. I, I, or what were we going to say, Ian? Nah, go ahead, man. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. I, uh, I definitely super vibe off of that. It's definitely like, you know, when you're in traffic and whatever, you know, I think it's almost just about trusting the process, you know, like you don't want to like you're doing these things. It's a process that you're learning to love. It's not about the outcomes. And so it's like, you're late, but you're on the way. So stressing about being late is not going to make you any less late. You just keep dry. Like, you know, you got to get through traffic. There's nothing you can do. So there's no point in like freaking out about it. And I think it's, a, it's good. To, I try to take that perspective too sometimes. Cause I definitely, if I'm not productive or whatever, but it's just like, you know, your masterwork or whatever your work, it's, it really does just, it just appears and you just got to show up and that's really it. And if you show up and nothing good comes out, they'll, oh, well, you know, then the next day. Um, but I actually wanted to kind of switch onto a, a similar topic here because Ian, you mentioned a, a handful of times about, uh, you kind of brought up this, you, you said something about like, uh, oh, people are actually making money doing this and actually like, this is actually a thing you could do. And, um, yeah. That's something I've been struggling, you know, like just kind of a big part of my growth is learning to have the confidence in myself that like, oh, I can make money doing the things that I love. And I'd just be curious what, um, you know, what your story has been like with that, like going like, oh, I can make money from my art and maybe, you know, maybe some takeaways and gems that you've like really picked up recently on that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I mean, I'll be, I'll be honest, like, I'm, you know, it's only recently where it's starting to become, you know, full time and like very where it's like, okay, I don't have to have my side hustle or like, I don't have to have, you know, where I'm like doing other side work or something else, you know, but, you know, it's always been the goal. And, you know, for however many years, you know, I've had this dream of being a full-time glass artist, you know, whether it started out as, you know, an idea, and then it kind of started out where, you know, working in restaurants full-time or, you know, working out in like California, you know, doing that whole like trim scene or whether, you know, it was working, doing production for other people. Um, I always had a side income you know, or if it's working with crypto or investing, or if it's, you know, doing some other means that can help supplement my income to take that stressor off of, you know, and that pressure off of glass, you know, for me of being like, oh my God, I have to make a hundred spoons this month to make sure I can pay my bills. And then I have to make sure I can sell all these, you know, but, you know, now it's the point where I have orders that are you know, I need to fulfill that are, you know, prepaid or, you know, they're, you know, they'll be paid once they're filled. 
but it's more of becoming a guaranteed thing. But it that's only very recently. And, you know, I'm, you know, it's not guaranteed forever. Um, you know, I would hope that I would, you know, it's only going to increase more and more. Um, but, you know, it's, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, I always had either a side job, side gig, or some other form of income or some other avenues of income to generate, to take that stress and pressure off. And then once you kind of see, you know, the balance shift where then your art starts to bring in money and being like, oh, wow, I made a couple grand this month. Okay. So like, maybe I try and do that again next month and see, you know, if I can do a little bit less of, you know, what my main source of income was and keep pushing with the art. And eventually, you know, the table turns to where you don't even have to do your other side, you know, incomes or anything. That's interesting. Did you, uh, was there a period where you were kind of like, have you ever been frustrated at that? Just like, man, I wish I was already full time. And I, I, you know, I resent that I have to go to my job at a restaurant and, you know, do any of that. Did you ever struggle with that kind of thing? Oh shit. Did we lose him? Huh? Oh, we might've. Oh, damn. It was just getting good right there too. Yeah, I know. Damn. I like his answer though. Just like always have a, always have like a side hustle. Like I think that takes some of the mystique out of it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I've like done the opposite of that. <laughs> I've yeah, like yeah. never, yeah. I've always just been like, cool. I got enough money for like rent <laughs> this month. So I'm just going to not work this month and just try to make music. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's worked out very well for me, but yeah, I think, I, I think I agree with it. It is good uh, advice. <laughs> Yo, so, so uh, just in case we lose Ian, like that was a good solid hour and was pretty cool. Um, I mean, I'm down to like, we can keep going back and forth, you and I, but how are you, how are you feeling? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm good with whatever. Um, I would like if we can't, uh, yeah, maybe we can stitch it together in post or something. But yeah, just to get a, a good bye with Ian or whatever, just to get his final thought there, if we can get that connected. See. I can text it really quick too. His computer might have died, I don't know. But uh, it, like, can we also get the 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 sh like Instagram or whatever for the guy that was doing the cool marbles you're talking about in Austin? Yeah, I'm tr I'm trying to find his stuff. I actually haven't yeah. seen him in a little over oh, a year. Oh shit, he's back! Oh, there we go. Nice. We were almost about to rap. Hell yeah! You're gonna rap? Well, we would. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe your computer died. I didn't know. No, I just all of a sudden I was like going on that rant, and then you guys froze, and then everything was gone. Oh, you yeah. just <laughs> your gold, huh? Yeah. Yeah, we were like, he's been talking too fucking long. Like, <laughs> get him out of here. No. I was like, oh, man, did I see something wrong? They just kicked yeah. me off. <laughs> oh, no. No, no, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, I wanted to kind of, yeah, finish that up. Yeah, what were you, uh, I think well, I had just You were saying, you like, did, do you ever, did you ever resent, like, do you ever resent feeling like you had to go to work, Ian, instead of just making money from glass or? Oh, Totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. I mean, I, you know, I used to be working like cannabis industry and, you know, I mean, it was always, I mean, being like a young kid and being like a stoner, you know, it's always like, oh, I live in Colorado. It's so cool. You know, I can do this, you know, and then it started realizing where like it took away so much from, you know, my art and like my true passion, you know, of like creating and especially like working for other people. I'm, I'm super stubborn. And that's like one of my own faults where it's like, not saying I hate being told what to do, but, you know, at a certain point where you're like, I know how something works. Why do I have to do it the way that you want me to do it? Even though it's like their business or whatever, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's my own, you know, those are my own things, but yeah, I mean, it definitely, it started, you know, it made me bitter towards, you know, certain jobs or certain places I was working, you know, and made it where, I, you know, it, all I'd want to do is just go blow glass and, you know, but with that even being said, once, you know, I made the transition over to going full-time with glass, there was a good probably like six, eight months where, you know, there was a, a, every day you wake up and you're just like, how am I going to pay for my like bills today? You know, and it's that, you know, pressure of just being like, okay, you got to go in, you just got to push and you got to push. And there's, you know, there's no other option. At least, you know, that's what I would tell myself. And it, you know, kind of started to enforce that drive, you know, to just want to work more, you know, and eventually things 
you know, click um, in one way or another, you know, at least, you know, in my situation and, you know, they're starting, you know, it's, it's starting to, you know, get better and better every day. Um, you yeah. Know. Did, you, did you like kind of, did you ever have a moment where you had to kind of change your perspective and just be like, yo, I know, you know, like, I know I'm good. I know that if I keep at this, it's going to work out. And just like, you know, this is what I got to do for now. And just kind of like, you know, just keep pushing forward. Like, just kind of like, you know, stick to, stick to what you believe. Like you're going to get there. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, there's, there's been plenty of breakdowns. There's been plenty of, you know, yeah. that those real, you know, you're, you're in a room alone working and you're just like, what am I doing? Yeah. You know, is this actually, you know, in those second thoughts, you know, and I know for myself, <laughs> whether it's like depression or, you know, just you get too deep into your head and it's like, those thoughts are super real of just like, what, like, can I do this? Why am I doing this? You know, and then you start like doubting yourself you know, you take a step away and you, you know, breathe a bit and maybe it's, you know, a day or you take the weekend off and you, know, you come back to it and you have a good day and, you know, it's, you, you finish it, you know, I finish a few things and end up selling them. And it's just like that weight off the shoulders of like, okay, fuck yeah, I can do this. Like, okay. It's, you know, it's, I'm not making tons, but, but it, it can happen, you know? And then, you know, you start to have more of those good days, but it's, keeping you know at least for myself I notice maintaining a positive attitude and like that positive like staying in that positive mental space and not getting like too down and out on myself for like putting too much of that pressure of like I have to just like like you were saying Aaron of just you know producing you know product and a finished product but just producing work and not having of like I have to make something that's like this good and gonna blow people away and be like you will but you don't have to do that today, you know, and maybe it does turn out to be that, but like, as long as you go in and just keep producing and keep working and keep having fun with it and remembering, like, that's why we do what we do is because we love what we do. And, you know, it's like, no one's sitting behind us with a whip, like, you know, <laughs> make more music, go paint more, you know, it's like, <laughs> this is our own choice for like our own misery or our own happiness, you know? So it's, it's I, for myself, I, I really try to just be like, yo, be fucking grateful because there's people that are struggling way harder than we are and you know give when you can but just be grateful and like love what you do and share that with people and make it where it's like yo we can all choose to do what we want but like just I guess you know long story short just being in you know the right mindset you know and being in the proper headspace you know for me really helps me produce more work and just want to work more but yeah i just want to chime in though like uh <laughs> i was i was the uh the phone call a couple times and i'm grateful for it because ian is also <laughs> the phone call that that i he's somebody that i call when i have my doubts in creative work but when ian was like taking the step off of the ladder from like gardening full-time to doing the glass full-time there was a couple phone calls over that summer where he was like bro, there's like, there's literally no money in this for me. I'm leaving something that paid well, what the fuck? And it was like, you know, all you did, all I did was just like, listen to him talk about it. And then it was like, well, I'm going to choose art every time. And so like, you know, just, just follow that. And like, I think like where Aaron is at is like very, very close, if not in the very same position, Ian, where you were, where you're like, you, you're saving nice. your foot off the ladder and like Aaron's doing the same thing he's like leaving okay I know how to make money that way but I want to make it this way like there's no way that we could have done that leap without support right like it's all about building the network and like being a good dude that's like when he calls me of course I'm going to answer the phone every time or the most 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 of the time you know and like I think where Aaron is at is like the same jumping off point and it's like that's the thing is like, there's nobody, nobody's going to do it for you, Aaron, except for you. And that's the coolest part is like, we're all just like sitting here waiting to watch you do it. And like, we all think you're good enough. Cause like, if you look at me and you're like, oh, he paints, like his paintings are cool. To me, I think of like 10 other painters that I think are like way better than me. And it's probably goes the same for Ian and glass yeah. and the same for like you producing music. But this morning I was painting and it was just like shadow sweat beats 
all morning. And it's just like, this is just as dope as like anything else I would put on, like straight up. And, and that's like, you know, like I'm not just, oh, you know, this is my homie, you have to listen to this. But it, that's what I'm saying is like, sometimes we hyper-focus on ourselves that we can't see how bril brilliant we get, you know? So like, for whatever it's worth, like, you know, don't, don't like not make those phone calls in moments of doubt, you know? Cause like, I, I think they're pivotal. They have been for me. Oh man. Well, thanks. Yeah. That's, I needed this shit today. Yeah. Thanks so much guys for like that advice and like hearing that, you know, I think it's, it's really important. I think a lot of people are in that struggle too. So it's, it's good to hear, you know? Yeah. You know, and I think we, you know, just going off with Jesse's saying, um, you know, you're going to have those moments where, you know, you're going to have those like, oh shit moments of like, what did I just do? What am I doing? And just take a moment and remember that you can always go get a job. You can always <laughs> figure something out, you know? And it, like, let me ask you this. Did it ever not work out? Like, did life just ever just stop? And you're just like, oh, like, like, no, we're here. Like, we've all had, you know, heart rough situations and good ones. But like, life keeps going. And it just wants you to make decisions, you know, and decide of like, you know, and, and do it when you're ready and when it feels right, you know, inside, you know, inside. But, you know, try and remember that it's like, even if you make that decision, and maybe, you know, you try and you try, and it's like, things aren't working out, you can always, you know, refigure the path you know reconfigure the path you can always go well this is my end goal maybe i'm just go looking at it wrong or maybe i'm like i need to tweak something and you can always you know just make some money and like reach out and talk to you know some friends or like you know just get some inspiration somewhere and then you come back to it and you're like okay cool we can do this now you know and life's gonna test us i mean it was what a month two months ago I had a homie, you know, he's, he's like a head grower for a company here in Colorado and, you know, they're like reconfiguring their whole systems and everything. And, you know, he, he calls me up and he's like, Hey, any chance you want to get back in the industry? He's like, I got like this really nice, you know, salary paying gig. You could like work for me and full benefits, you know, you know, PTO, everything. I was just like, fuck, <laughs> like, you know, it, it fucked me up. Like there was like a week, two weeks where I was just like, I could stop what I'm doing and I could go like settle and I could go have that solid paying job and be set for like, for life, you know, just doing that and making like really good money. And I had to like sit with myself a lot and just be like, but then I'd be cutting myself short, you know? And it's like a job like that's always going to be back there. If I wanted to get back in restaurants, like you can always go do that. And maybe you got to work your way up the ladder again, but it's always there where doing what we do in all of our own ways it's just putting the time in and remembering that it's like it's never going to happen overnight but trusting in that process and being like you like you can do it you know it's just staying true to yourself and just putting in the work yeah but leonard blessing us with this wisdom hell yeah <laughs> this episode got fucking epic right around like 40 minutes in it just got deep good yeah that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> Go deep. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Yo, uh, Ian, thank you so much for jumping on the call with us. Like really, uh, really humbled to have you be our first official guest. Um, and we hope to have you back sometime. I mean, you know, be, no, you're, don't be a stranger now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is, yeah, it's been fun. You know, it's, yeah, I'm excited. I'm curious to see like where you guys go with this, you know, and where are we all go? It'd be fun. Totally. Yeah, same here. Great to meet you, Ian. Yeah, likewise, Aaron. It's a pleasure. Yeah, I'll hit you up sometime if uh, after the COVID and if I'm up in Colorado. Oh, I'm, please uh, do, man. Might, might be going back up there soon. Nice. Please yeah, please do. This show with all three of us would be epic someday. So <laughs> you got dicks. We do three nights here. Oh no. Okay, <laughs> maybe one night for me. Oh. Uh, all right. See if dude. we can get Fishman on the show, that'd be cool. Yeah, oh no, man, now we're talking. Now we're talking. <laughs> Good. That'd be great. <laughs> It'll happen. It'll happen. I believe it. Moo moo. Fucking almost out. Uh, <laughs>